My first involvement in the tattoo world was on February 8th, 1976. That's when I got my first tattoo done at a small tattoo studio in Wood Green in North London. By the time I got to 1978, um, I was doing some hand poke tattoos and had got some rough equipment. And then I always say 1979 is when I really began to start. It was quite a different journey then for the, as opposed to the artists now. No internet, no readily available equipment. It was very cloak and dagger, very secretive. A lot of the equipment was second hand or, you know, handmade, not that good quality. Um, but it was always interesting to find new ideas, new techniques, new little secrets. Like all the tattooists you met, they all kept their cards close to their chest. So you had to try and glean little bits of information out of them. And gradually you kind of build up a recipe book of, of tattoo information, if you like. And that's what I did. The, the mid to the mid 70s to the early 1980s were a very interesting time for me, particularly in London musically. We'd had the big Teddy Boy revival and rock and roll revival, which then branched out to become Rockabilly. Then punk came along. The two of those began to fuse together and we got Psychabilly. So there were all these different cult groups going on. But at the same time, we had Madness, the two tone thing. So, you know, at various times I was into all those scenes. I mixed with people from all of them. And a lot of the tattoo studios at the time just did flash off of the walls. You know, that's the way it was back then. You went in, you picked something off the wall, had it done on you. I was fascinated by all the record covers. You know, there was lots of artwork going on, lots of independently published fanzines, um, singles, albums used to be a record shop up the road here in North Finchley called Arcade Records and every Thursday all the picture discs would be in the window so I was mad on punk music so I used to buy all of those and then if people came in like with the Anti Nowhere League Fist or uh, Pusshead, Mohican Skull I started to do this work and a magazine called Punk Lives did a double page feature um, back then it was quite unusual to see um, big spreads on tattoo and there weren't any tattoo magazines available and I was just inundated with punks from everywhere who wanted to come and get tattooed. Um, also 1982 I went to America to the Queen Mary convention um, which was a big expo that Ed Hardy, Ernie Carafa put on. Um, while I was there I met Leo Zulueta, he was a punk tattooist um, and now very famous for his tribal work. But at the time he was designing flyers, posters for punk bands. Um, and he gave me some Borneo designs he'd drawn. I came back to London and this really stunning girl called A.D. Grimmer, she had a big red Mohican. She asked me to tattoo these on the side of her head. And back then it was massively radical, you know. She, as I said, she was a very stunning looking girl and she was picked up to be photographed by a lot of photographers and I was very, very fortunate that those pieces of work got so much prominence in books and magazines and with it, publicity for the shop really. Well, tattoos, tattoos uh, uh, in 2014, we're seeing them absolutely everywhere on everything, you know. Uh, eventually, this will finish, you know, people, models, tattooed models that are so in vogue now, won't be. It's like, we had curvaceous women, we've had the Kate Moss type women, we've had the heroin chic look, you know, things change. It's similar to punk. Punk was an underground movement. Then it started to gain more of a following. Then it was picked up by the advertising media, people like Matt Belgrano with his big Mohican and that, um, you know, fashion houses started to pick up on watered down punk kind of clothes. And now, yeah, you see punks down in Camden Town, you'll see a few at revival shows or at specific concerts, but it's not the force it was then. Tattooing now is massive worldwide. You know, there's so many unbelievable artists out there, but I just think human beings being the way they are, there will come to a point where it's not as trendy and not as popular 
as it is. I mean, the, the rise of tattooing has been interesting because so many other contributing factors need to be brought in and the internet has to be one of the biggest and also satellite television, reality TV shows, celebrity, sport. Before, you wouldn't see any sports people with tattoos. Then we started to see the NBA players in America, which then influenced in this country, the same as hip hop, the black community to get tattoos. When I, when I was a kid, very few of my black friends had tattoos. You know, it just didn't seem to be something that, that they had done. And then suddenly people are influenced. They see Tupac, you know, they see Dennis Rodman, see people with tattoos. So it's been very interesting to see from the early days of Titbits magazine or News of the World running a little article on tattooing to seeing next door in the little Asian shop there where the top shelf used to be full of softcore porno. Now it's just full of tattoo magazines. You know, there's over 20 different ones on the shelf in there, which is phenomenal. You've got TV shows on all the time showing it, you know, but Lots of people do get tattooed for fashion, you know, or they're influenced by the media, things they see in the media. And in the end, I just think that you're going to find a lot of companies that make lasers are going to be selling a lot of them. There will always be a demand for tattooing, always. Human beings will always mark their body. But I've been saying it for 20 years, when is the bubble going to burst? But I can't honestly see it keep going, 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 because so the, the equipment is so easy to get now. There's so many shops opening up that in the end, everyone's digging into that pie. And I just think it's going to be very hard for some people to still make a living at tattooing, especially if they've got expensive overheads for things, you know? I mean, for every tattoo studio, there's two people working at their houses. There's always been a debate of, to some degree in tattooing over tattooists and tattoo artists or dermographic artists, whatever they want to call themselves. Tattooists, I think, are probably people like myself who have some artistic skills. Um, we, we often will work off of stencils or work off of flash or that's how we first started in the business. And the tattoo artists are probably people with perhaps more of an art background or more artistic skills. Um, you know, whichever way. Some people call us tattooers, some call us scratchers, you know. As for tattoo studios, tattoo parlour, tattoo shop, I don't really care what they call it, you know. I, I call it a studio, you know. Some people call it a parlour. Some call it a shop. It doesn't make any difference. It's what goes on in there that's important. You... The, the reality TV shows have been um, a blessing and a hindrance, I think, to a lot of tattoo artists. Um, they certainly caused great interest within tattooing. Um, and the public lapped up these shows. You've got you know, channels that show them all the time. The reality is reality shows aren't real, you know, but they do make people aware of tattooing. And when Miami Ink first came out, Army James did a koi carp on one episode. Everyone I spoke to said, God, people keep asking for koi carp. So, you know, it kept, kept shops going, but it then also influenced people to open shops. Look how many shops opened up that just put ink on the end of their name. We were always, you know, tattoo, and now it's ink. That's one of the changes that we, we saw within it. Um, the, the reality shows, though, there's the new ones now, Tattoo Masters and Best Ink and America's Worst Tattoos and Tattoo Nightmares and that, you know, but that's because the general public just lap up reality programs of all different genres and types, don't they, you know? Tattooing to me, um, I had an interest in it from, from being a young child, I think, through members of my family that had been in the military. Um, my my great-grandfather, he was 97 when he died. He had his first tattoo when he was 12. 
Um, I had uncles that had travelled the world. What we were saying about the internet, I'm 55 now, which even going back 50 years to being like five or 45 years to being 10, when I used to see, because telly wasn't on all the time, we looked at books more and at home we had encyclopedias and things and you, you'd look and see different countries around the world. Everything seemed a million, million miles away, you know. And I think looking at my uncle's tattoos, they all had sailing ships, they'd all been in the Navy or the Army. My, my dad's brother had uh, pyramids with Egypt on it and Maltese Cross with Malta places that he'd gone. My other uncle's Hong Kong. So I think there was a kind of um, a wanderlust in my head about what these places were. You know, I probably thought my uncle at the time went to Hong Kong on a galleon. Not on a, not on a battleship, you know. So, I've always had this interest in it. I've also been attracted to, I don't know what some people may describe as the antisocial side of life or underground. I always enjoyed being in the company of, you know, like I said, with the punk rock scene, with with movements that aren't quite so mainstream. Um, I always describe it as keeping up appearances in my life. You know, my mum's side of the family were the hyacinth bouquets and my dad's side of the family were the, the fighting Irish, if you like. So part of me is very conservative in, in how I live my life and the other side can or used to be uh, a, a bit wild or quite a lot wild, you know. And tattooing and the, the people, the different groups that had it, I found myself gravitating towards clubs that were like that, to gigs, to to that kind of lifestyle, if you like. So it, then when I first started tattooing, um, it gave me an opportunity to do something that I liked. Um, and, you know, doing it, there's been good times, bad times. Most of the, the times have been really good for me. I have to I always say that if I die, go to heaven, and against my better beliefs, there is... Uh, man with a white beard there, I will, you know, shake him warmly by the hand and thank him for the, the chance that I had to do this for a job. You know, I've travelled, I've met lots of people, it's given me immense opportunities. You have to put the hours in, you have to put the time in, there can be lots of frustrations with it, but there's, most of the time, as I said, I think I'm really, really lucky and I do appreciate it and I just, I just feel that I was lucky to have that opportunity. Now that door's open to lots more people, and I, I would hope that they really appreciate the fact that some people go to work nine to five, you know, as wage slaves, and we do have quite a bit of autonomy, really, to be able to listen to what music we want when we're at work, dress how we want, um, you know, use our mobile phones and whatever. I think, you know, we've got a lot of freedom with it. So I, I'm always grateful that I had the opportunity to do this as a job. It's one, the, the positive discrimination, or however they want to call it, I used to call it multicolour discrimination when they wouldn't let you into a, a club or a bar because you had tattoos. It's just the way it is now. I mean, you know, when I first started tattooing, not many women got tattooed. Now there's young girls that are heavily tattooed, tattooed models, tattooed porno sites for girls, tattooed glamour sites. You know, it just seems to be if you're a tattooed female, now there's lots of opportunities out there, modelling agencies and things. But as I keep saying, you know, we're, we're enjoying this upsurge at the moment, but people will get bored with that, you know? People will, you'll find that bars suddenly want women with no tattoos showing, you know? And the funny thing is, I've got friends that have got pubs, like rock pubs and that, and they wanted girls with, with tattoos and barmen with tattoos. You know, that, that was the thing, because they were serving people who were the same as that. Now it's really mainstream, you know. And really, it shouldn't be a consideration whether you're tattooed or not. It should be how you do your job. That's the real truth of the matter, you know. I mean, one of the big burger outlets didn't used to employ people who had tattoos on their lower arms, but they would serve lots of burgers to people with tattoos on their lower arms. So, you know, it's quite interesting, that side of things. You know, pe people ask me 
um, if I've ever refused to tattoo anyone or any, or any designs and that. And yeah, lots of different things. First of all, you know, people that are underage, you know, that's one of the, the no-nos. Um, I don't do political tattoos or racist tattoos. Um, you know, we don't do genital tattoos in this shop. If a, des a design may be something that someone's bought in that is just not actually suitable as a tattoo, it might be too small, too complex. Um, I always try and explain to them, maybe we can redraw it or we can make it into a tattoo style. And sometimes people seem perturbed by the fact that you don't want to do it. But I always say to them, listen, I could lie to you, take your money off you, do the tattoo and you will never be happy with it. Or we can tell you the truth. And, you know, we're not, we're not worried if they decide they want to go somewhere else and see if that person can do it for them. But as I said, you know, facial tattooing, no. Genital tattooing, no. Racist, political tattooing, no. Because there's so many other people who come in who do want things. I mean, there's shops that cater for absolutely everything now, you know. It just happens to be that for me, the reason I don't do facial tattooing, and it's quite interesting, is um, Derek Ridges has just had a new book published of his old photos called London Youth 78 to 87. And there's a guy in there who's got his face tattooed. And years ago, when I first got into the business, I was working in a psychiatric hospital. I was also working at a tattoo studio at weekends. And the owner told me to tattoo a guy's face and I refused to do it. And the owner was like, I just don't know what's wrong with you. And he did it. And then a couple of months later, I went into a locked ward, which was where the patients that were a danger were kept. And there was the guy with the facial tattoos locked in this ward. I'm not saying the tattoos made him mental or the guy who did it, but for me, I, it became a taboo then, you know, and I just have always had that, that I wouldn't do facial tattooing, you know. Um, it's very popular now. Lots of people, it seems to be much more socially acceptable than it used to be. In the 1980s when the skinhead movement, um, you know, revived and kind of changed from the reggae influence one more to the sort of more aggressive type music. There were lots and lots of people with their faces tattooed. Um, there were two tattooists in London at the time who were actively tattooing young kids' faces. Um, one of them could put on really good tattoos, which probably made it harder for them to be removed. And the other guy just put on absolute rubbish and garbage and a very dubious character. But you know, you see some of these guys, the ones that are still around, begging outside King's Cross Station or that, you know, I don't really feel that I want to take responsibility for doing that to someone. You know? So as I say, just my personal view of how I work. When, when I first started tattooing, I would say that the clientele was predominantly uh, white, mainly male, um, probably 18 to 35 year old age group. A few girls living in North London around this way, believe it or not, we used to get a lot of Turkish and Cypriot people because there was a lot of people in Haringey that used to come and get tattoos. And at the time there was the, the conflict, so some people would get Turkish crescent and star, some people would get the map of Cyprus or a dove. Um, and then gradually over the years we've seen it, seen it change that lots of people from different, different ethnic backgrounds now get tattoos. Um, people of different ages come in. Um, it's still quite a young person's game, but you know we've had people that are in their 70s and 80s that have come in. And I think that shows the acceptability of it now that you know years ago, people people would still get tattooed occasionally you'd get people that were older or professionals but they would keep the tattoos hidden and you know what the funny thing is I speak to a few of my peers and a few of the other old timers and that and because tattoos are everywhere now we all kind of got the same little jokey thing wouldn't it be good if you had to keep them all under your sleeves and all that so that when you went to a show and someone revealed it you'd be like wow now they got what they call hipster body suits where somebody's got their throat tattooed and their hands and nothing else so but you know it'd be interesting to see 
you know, in 30 years' time, when a filmmaker goes to talk to a young tattooist who's then an old-timer, to see their views on things and to see where tattooing is in the future and artistically where it's gone, you know, because it is on the up. It's, it's amazing, but it's interesting to see.